So I think we're going to do is Stacy's going to head over to the panel table and we're going to just let those that conversation continue with the panelists. And she's going to be joined by Dr. Bruce Sherman, Medical Director, Population Health Management for the Write Up Private Exchange offering for Buck Consultants at Xerox, also Medical Director of the Ohio based Employers Health Coalition. And then lastly, to join Dr. Glenn Stetton, who leads innovation at Express Scripts. So let's get the panel up there. And we're going to continue this conversation. So I thought probably the most interesting aspect of the morning um, appears to be the use of Time magazine covers as critical components of any presentation. Uh, and Stacy, that was a deficiency of your talk. We'll, we'll discuss that later. Um, so in this session, we're going to continue in a way from that first panel this morning as we talk about how do we, how do we assign value, how, do we, how are costs going to be factored into decision making, and kind of who's going to be responsible for that management. And, and it almost seems like there needs to be a new sheriff in town, and I guess that's going to become the PBM. So, so Glenn, maybe we start with you in, in regard to, you know, is your job to become Wyatt Earp of Tombstone and rein in the Wild West of drug pricing? Yeah, so I, at Express Scripts, our customers are patients, and our customers are those who pay for their care. So it includes large employers who self-insure. It includes large health plans. Um, our customers include taxpayers. Um, and we also have uh, plans, Medicare Part D plans, where we are actually the insurer. And we look at the issue of drug prices as one of an ethical issue. An ethical issue meaning that if you think about the value of health insurance, for some people it's about access to care. For some people it's about preventing financial catastrophe. And when you look at the cost of these cancer drugs and some of the other very expensive specialty drugs, a very few people, if they didn't have insurance, could afford it or have any access at all. So we try and help our, our, our customers um, to understand the dynamics and how to continue to afford, have an affordable benefit for everyone while also being able to afford um, the very expensive treatments for people who really need them. And as we look at the prices in cancer and any of the other specialty conditions, we have a, we have a belief that the prices are unfair. And when I say unfair, if you think we heard some of the other speakers already earlier today, if you look at the prices in Western Europe, developed countries, um, they are significantly less expensive than they are here in the United States. We heard one, you know, uh, hypothesis which, you know, makes some sense about tax rates, right? Maybe it's about tax rates. If the tax rates were lower here, um, the price of the drugs would be lower. But it's also about culture. And in Europe, you have government that negotiates prices and makes decisions for the population about things that are not going to be available, not because they don't necessarily work but because they're budget busters and they have a, a population that goes along with that, right? We have to manage to what we can afford as a country. That's not the case in the United States. I'm not advocating the government should negotiate prices. I think that the private sector has a very significant role, and I'd point out what we did with hepatitis C in negotiating the prices. Gilead's on the record that their average discount this year has been 46%. Had we not leveraged competition in the marketplace with the second drug in the market, we wouldn't have that. So in cancer therapy, we are looking very hard um, at where we have clout to be able to negotiate. We represent 30, 85 million Americans, um, over 4,000 payers, and I think we have a significant, what well, we play a significant role and we'll have an increasingly significant role as more and more very expensive drugs come to market. So Bruce, what role do the employers play and is it simply to, you know, to, 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 to basically hire the gun, um, in the case of the PBM, to do their work? Do they actively help to guide the PBM in policy? That can be done for orals and the pharmacy benefit. Can, will it also be an evolving into giving PM, PBMs control over the medical benefit? What's that role for the employers in terms of whether they're really working through the insurers and if they're self-insured, or if self-insured, insurers and or PBM? Great question. What I'd, I'd like to do before answering that question is just take a step back and acknowledge um, that the title of this conference is, includes the words patient-centered. And we've talked about cost and affordability. Um, 
I think it's absolutely critical to acknowledge in the recent, actually, uh, study that was released this morning from Commonwealth Fund that a quarter of individuals find their health care unaffordable. And these are people with uh, private insurance. So when we bring it down to the individual level, um, it, it, it's becoming a rapidly um, growing problem of such magnitude that uh, I think for both individuals and for the employers for which they work, this is approaching um, crisis proportions. People are having to decide between um, a balance of uh, uh, paying for treatment or um, going bankrupt. So I, I want to make this more personal and, and take this away from a more abstract discussion, if I may. Um, I think it's important to keep that in mind. These are real people that are struggling with um, healthcare dollars. From that perspective, employers really don't have the level of input uh, from an individual perspective to substantially influence um, uh, PBM or health plan activities. They can certainly um, make strong recommendations, advocacy groups or, or business coalitions, I should say, are in a much better position to uh, encourage or, or prompt uh, a, a more conscious, rational, value-based approach to care, but generally employers are really relying on the, the PBM to be that, that hired gun to provide the, uh, the, the level of control and management for uh, Healthcare service delivery, such that those costs are not uh, excessive for uh, for benefits and rollies. So, Stacy, you know, you would think, given this general discussion and this patient centricity, that a PBM like Express Scripts is really serving the patient um, and helping them in their quest for affordable healthcare. And yet, the provider side usually sees the PBM as obstructionist. Um, they're, they're really interfering with the autonomy of the physician-patient decision-making and relationship. They're delaying care in, or proceed to delay care in some. So I'm interested in your perspective as we talk about this and heard your presentation um, and your role in the clinic working with the doctors on how they see this and what they're looking for and how is it going to get controlled? Do they want to be, the, the doctors want to be in that position of having to drive the financial conversation? How do, they, how do they think it should be controlled if they don't like the control that's currently there now? Sure, so I think like was stated earlier. Bring that mic closer, you're a quiet talker. I hear myself when I do that. Um, so I think like was said earlier, physicians really don't have that in their makeup to want to have that financial conversation with the patient. Um, it is an individual conversation where they're trying to make it to that wedding or that next birthday and if a therapy will give them that extra few weeks of therapy, it's hard in that one-on-one -on -one situation, like was said earlier, to practice what you preach, basically. That being said, um, within our practice specifically for IV medications as well as in the pharmacy for oral medications, the PA process and the number of FTEs um, that we have to maintain access to care continues to grow. We have on the clinic side um, three divisions now basically where someone gets the PA for the medication and then it rolls over to copay or foundation assistance and then if that's not available there's a separate team to handle free drug. So obviously um, the administrative burden is quite severe in that regard. I think the other factor to consider in this is that as we look at some of the patent expirations that may be coming is that sometimes the non-branded agents that are generic and may be preferred initially don't come out with that much of a delta to the cost of the branded product. 
but when it's not a branded pharmaceutical, we don't have the patient access programs and hubs that the manufacturers provide for that copay assistance. And oftentimes, for that little offset in the cost to the system, the cost to the patient is much more. So a, a potential impact on the adoption of biosimilars or the need for the biosimilar manufacturers to have to up the game, and if they do, then how much of a cost differential. So Glenn, I want to get back to you, and, and I, I see you're ready to go, and I want to give you more to go with, because um, you have kind of your unique position in which you have no friends. Um, because on the one hand, you're having to deal with pharma and really negotiate on price. On the other hand, you know, the physicians who would help hopefully think of you as, you know, a patient's friend, are seeing you as somebody who's layering work and responsibility on them as you manage through prior author impact autonomy, through tiering, step edits, et cetera. So um, it puts you in an, in an uncomfortable position. How do you see that? How does that role evolve and how does that change? How do you get the respect you deserve? Well, uh, we, can argue, we can argue about respect, but <laughs> um, our job is to make medicine as affordable and safe and effective as we can. That's what our customers hire us for. And from a standpoint of affordability, and you know, Stacy gave the example with generics. We buy generics on behalf of 85 million people, and we're a different class of trade than a physician practices. So while it may look like the generic comes out at marginally less or the same price as the brand drug when it first comes to market, our customers are paying far less than that when it's sourced appropriately, just as an example. But we focus on a couple areas. We focus on unit prices because we think that drugs should be fairly priced for the value that they create. And the second area that we focus on is utilization, whether the drug needs to be used, whether the amount is appropriate, the duration of therapy. And all of these things add up. I mean, it may sound like it's little tweaking around the edges, but we processed 1.3 billion prescription claims last year. We did prior authorization on about 5 million. Right? So it's not all of them. Oncology, you feel it in particular because so many of the drugs are very expensive. Um, on average, we approve 87% of the requests that we get for oncology drugs. For certain therapies, it's 98%. What are the reasons that we're not approving the therapy? A lot of the, what we see are either people not following evidence-based medicine from a standpoint of did they try or are they using certain concomitant therapies at the same time when they're appropriate and they just have not thought to do it? Um, many of the times it's because they're using therapy in an experimental way for which there's not evidence that it, it's been effective. And you know, we feel for the patients, right? They, you know, a lot of in cancer treatment, it's desperate. There's nothing else. But the policies, the insurance policies, the plan coverage, there are rules and the intent of the, the plan is to pay for therapy that is known to be safe and effective. Um, and, we're, and so as, as an organization, given our responsibility to enforce that, it makes us unpopular. So will we ever have respect there? I'm not sure. But from the standpoint of the savings that we deliver to our customers who spend over $5 billion a year on cancer drugs, the savings are very significant. And that improves the affordability and access to everyone, which is, again, um, you know, just a, you know, tack on to what Bruce said earlier about patients and people, we need to be able to afford to have access to care. So, so Bruce, you're in an, a, a difficult position as you try to, to guide your clients through the process because un unlike what we heard about what's happening in Europe, for instance, from Glenn's prior comments, our society has a different cultural position um, in regard to healthcare and in regard to life. We're a society in which we have different values. And one could argue that whereas in Asia, there's a greater reliance on traditioner, traditional medicine or, or traditional healthcare. Uh, and in, in Europe, there's maybe a greater cynicism uh, to novelty. Um, and, and so they're tolerating decisions that come across from organizations like NICE. In the US, what we value is new over old, we value now over later, and we value more over less. And as a society that has those values that expect the same from healthcare, because I don't want to be in watch and wait, I want a drug, I want it now, I want the antibiotic, I don't care if you think it's viral. Um, how, do, how does your role in trying to guide these employers um, address that issue of kind of the cultural makeup of the population that's being cared for? 
That is a, a fabulous question. Um, and, and I think we are headed on a collision course between the rapid growth of more expensive technologies and, and treatments, as well as diagnostics, and uh, society's inability to pay for them. Uh, Social Security Administration came out with a figure that was mind-boggling to me. 51% of U.S. working adults earn less than $30,000 a year. So if you imagine that we're putting available treatments out at, at, at uh, incredible cost, people are now going to have to make really tough decisions about uh, personal bankruptcy, uh, as a um, as a, an outcome of uh, a need for treatment, and uh, I appreciate earlier comments, both last night and this morning, about the physician's role or the healthcare team's role in uh, a more candid and open discussion about cost of treatment. Because I, I think we have to we have to do that. Uh, from our perspective, it's, it's a matter of encouraging those uh, decisions between patients and providers, encouraging uh, employees and their family members to ask about costs when they are uh, talking with physicians. Uh, and I, I think we're just going to, to see more and more of this in, uh, in, in the coming um, months and years. So, so Stacy. As I go around um, in a lot of my work, which is with physicians at medical meetings, and I see a lot of my old friends, like my old buddies from Tennessee Oncology, and what they'll tell me is that um, it's kind of a Dickensian because it's the best of times and worst of times. And there's, it's never been more difficult to practice medicine from all the administrative burden and having to work with meaningful use EMRs that are not really clinically but business oriented. And at the same time, the therapeutic arsenal is more exciting than it's ever been. So you probably hear this all the time with your docs. What do you do in your role administratively to try to let them have the part they love and minimize the negatives of the part they hate? Sure. So, um, and I'll go back just one minute to Glenn and say, you know, the, the PAs and keeping therapy within line, we certainly respect that. Um, and we have those candid conversations with physicians internally when we see that they may be a little bit rogue on some things. So um, I think there is that combustion, if you will, in that while some step edits and prior authorizations are definitely necessary, when you take the government mandates and the reporting and check this box. One of the physicians told me the other day, they said everybody just wants one more box checked. You know, so the information is in their notes, but they have to go back and check a box everywhere. So it is very frustrating for them. From a, a standpoint of how we communicate to our docs, there's very little um, in absolute dollar amounts and cost of therapy. And so I think there may be an educational factor in that because while they may know that something is expensive, there's no cut points or in that. Expensive could be 4,000 or it could be 20,000 and they don't know that distinction because that's not given to them, you know, how would you give it to them? Would you give it to them in our cost or in what it's costing the system, et cetera? So we've not tried to bog them down with that really, but um, I know there's some talk about EMR data and pathways, kind of having a protocol analyzer, if you will. Our billing office uses that type of program where the cost of therapies are compared that may be something that physicians would not only benefit from, but actually want to know because they may be unintentionally using drug A over drug B and not realizing the significant impact and cost. So, so Bruce, right, we've got, we've got cost to the patient, we've got cost to the doctor, um, we've got cost to the insurance company, and we've got cost to society. So what's the right, how, how do we juggle those? I mean, how, how do you prioritize? What's the most important? That is the struggle. 
Um, I think um, there are no, no ready answers here. I think there are ways to, um, to mitigate that by um, approaching the, um, these new uh, treatments with innovative contracting approaches such as value-based or outcomes-based um, uh, purchasing um, or delivery of medications um, and services uh, to more effectively align the outcomes with the, the costs of, uh, of the related services. Um, but I don't think there are any easy answers. We, we are entering this period where we have um, science and technology uh, growing much faster than, than wages and the affordability gap um, is, is rapidly, rapidly growing. So, so if, we're, if we were going to be truly patient-centered, we might say to patients, you could have this $100,000 therapy, and this is the benefits and how much extra life you can expect, or you can have $100,000, which do you prefer? Right? It wouldn't cost us any different, and the patient could use their values as to what they prefer. Now, I'm, not, I'm not saying that that's exactly what we should do, but from a patient-centered standpoint, we have to think about what people would do for themselves if they could. When the therapy is unaffordable, it's unfair to ask the patient. But when we, if it's insured and that's part of the benefit, why not give them the money as an option as, a, as, a, as opposed to the therapy? In terms of the price, we're working on a couple of fronts. You heard from Peter Bach this morning, we're working with Peter, we're working with Steve, I, uh, Steve Pearson at ICER around what is fair value for the drugs, right? Express Scripts, we're not in a position to say what's the right price for these drugs but others from a standpoint of what value does it create for the patient, what value does it create for the, for the, the society, what's the manufacturer charging for it. Those are ratios that some drugs are fairly priced, some drugs are way overpriced. Hepatitis C was a great example. ICER and the Cal California Technology Assessment Foundation at $85,000, way too expensive. In the low 40s, it was worth it. And when we drove the price there, our customers were able to remove restrictions on only treating people who had severe cirrhosis, F3 and F4 disease, and treat everyone who's infected with the virus. So fair pricing makes therapy more accessible to everyone. And then even if the therapy is still very expensive, we have, I mean, part of what we have to do as a PBM and help our customers in rationalizing not just the advances in, in, in cancer treatment, but the cancer in every category, and again, affordable benefits for everyone. So Glenn, do you see a role as the PBMs consolidate and you have such a large percent of the population that each of the PBMs is now managing, um, where those questions of transparency of cost, trans questions about value, um, are things that you'll be incorporating into physician, which in a way is the customer, another customer's, uh, of yours, but in a physician-facing point-of-care decision support tool where it becomes easier, the PA is kind of automated and pre-populated, do you see that as, a, as something which your company or companies like yours will be investing in in order to help to decrease some of the burdens that exist but also perform the education that's necessary? Yeah, so I don't see PA going away anytime soon. However, I do see a transformation in PA and we're at the beginning of what I would call the hockey stick in terms of electronic adjudication of the prior authorization. So we're probably up to about 15% now from zero a year ago of instantly rendered decisions um, the practice can enter online and, and, and get information. Primarily on the pharmacy benefit, we still have more work to do as it relates to drugs that we manage under the medical benefit. And many of the cancer drugs are managed under the medical benefit. But reducing the administrative burden we don't, you know, it's not our desire to do that or a desire to be a part of that, but the fact of the matter is as much as maybe none of us like it, it saves a lot of money. Um, it saves a lot of money from the standpoint of it prevents a lot of requests that would otherwise be requested um, that might not conform and it catches ones that don't. And when you're $100,000 a year therapy, a small percentage pays for itself very quickly. So we're definitely, we're, we're, we're definitely working there. In terms of transparency, Beneficiaries who have benefits administered, at least by our company, on their mobile application, on our mobile application today, you can put in any medication and we will tell you the price at the pharmacy, at the different pharmacies, and we need to work there towards the price from a standpoint of physician practice as well. Yeah, I mean, the problem with that is that then you have to sit there and go to an app and plug all that in as opposed to when the patient comes in, 
the patient, you pick the disease, and here it's all right there. And for you. we're working. You know, we are a founder, a founder and, and of SureScripts, which routes the prescriptions and the connectivity with the electronic medical records. We're working on clinical interoperability. The last thing I think physicians want are now spamming into their EMRs, um, <laughs> but working on a rational. What is the right way to communicate the information and what, what time, including what things cost? Great. All right. Remaining couple of minutes, questions from the audience, hands up. Mics are being passed around. I see one up here. Hi. So I'm from NCQA, and obviously I'm a proponent of patient-centered um, medical care. And I just want to say I agree with uh, Glenn and Stacy in terms of making sure that when we talk about um, shared decision-making, Patients have to be involved, and that includes the cost, not only the cost of oncology medications, any medications for that matter. So I totally agree with you that that has to be a required discussion. You got another one over here. You got one over there. So, so I'm Marion Grant. I'm a palliative care nurse practitioner from the University of Maryland, and I really appreciate the focus since yesterday on cost, especially as affects patients. And I know these are difficult conversations, but I want to reinforce something that's come up a few times, and that is that there is an inexpensive treatment that would improve quality of life, would improve symptom management, might even improve survival, and that is palliative care, and, and it is an evidence-based treatment. So when we hear and talk about desperate patients who want to live for a wedding, we, we need to keep in mind that we have affordable options that we can use in addition to expensive drugs or expensive other treatments. And I think we're so used to thinking of medications and treatments that we forget that this is an option too. And this might be, if, if you gave patients $120,000 and you described what palliative care was, I bet a bunch of them would spend some of that money on it. So just want to remind people that that is a factor to help reduce some of the cost, but maybe improve some of the outcomes. All right, we've got one more, and then we'll close out the session. Sure. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Ray Hole, I direct the Penn State Cancer Institute. And um, I've been, uh, I'm a medical oncologist and been practicing for 25 years or so, have lived through a homegrown EMR uh, at University of Iowa, Epic, Cerner at Penn State, uh, and, you know, it's from my perspective, this is the first time I'm at this meeting, it's remarkable that as a provider, um, I, I don't eat, I have trouble knowing what the cost or the price of things are. And so I have patients all the time asking me, and the EMRs, you know, if I try to do a prescription, it needs to be, uh, or preferably uh, electronically logged in, and it will prevent me from moving forward if I don't have the right number of tablets or, or describe it as a tablet or a capsule uh, and I get a choice as to which one. Uh, and it'll also prevent, yeah, I have to indicate a start time for an outpatient prescription and, and so on. But it would seem to me that if the payers are really interested in controlling this, to somehow have in there what the cost is going to be. Um, because I have people asking me routinely, how much is it going to be? And I shrug my shoulders and more often than not, pass it off to the pharmacy and say, well, let's file a test claim and see. Uh, and there ought to be a way to integrate that for different payers into the EMRs. And I wonder what your thoughts are on that, appreciating the comment about spam uh, in our systems. Yeah, so for the, for the patient, and you may think differently, but in general when patients are asking what is the cost, they really mean what are my out-of-pocket costs whether they have coinsurance and are paying a percentage or a flat copayment, they're, they're, they're thinking about that from a dollar perspective. And you know, I think that that's the right thing for patients to think about. That's their cost implication. As I said, in the pharmacy application we have, they can all find out, and they can even find out the different prices at different pharmacies. Um, for the physician, we are working with SureScripts as an example so that we can at least, if we can't provide you the information before, immediately we can let you know the patient's eligibility, their coverage, um, and their out-of-pocket costs based on that decision, um, as well as the price of alternatives. But we're not there yet. So I want to thank the panelists and all the speakers from this morning. Lunch is going to be out and to the right where breakfast was. Looking forward to having you all back for this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>